The following message is a presentation of the Sun Life Radio Network. Amen. You're in Jeremiah chapter 1. Amen. I got a couple of folk there. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Now, I want to read that verse again, just the latter half of it. The things God has called Jeremiah to do. Notice it. I have set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. In the ministry, we oftentimes like to consider ourselves as great builders, great planters. We're looking to build something for the Lord. And that is absolutely correct, and that is absolutely right. But in the religious atmosphere in which we live today, the religious atmosphere that exists within people's lives and in the church itself, there's a ministry that must take place, and that is a ministry of the Word of God that roots something out, pulls something down, destroys something, and throws down something. Listen to me closely. We want ministries, oh, just to be successful and to abounding in people, and God has promised us that, and we'll get to that. But I want you to know that if you're going to be a true minister of the gospel in this day and in this hour, you're going to face religious systems and religious thinking and wrong thinking of the church. And before we're able to, in fact, do a work for God or see God perform in the church in the way that he wants to perform, we're going to have to see things rooted out, pulled down, destroyed, and thrown down. It means that we've got to become aware that we are in a time frame right now, ladies and gentlemen, of transition. And that transition is not easy. That transition is difficult as wrong mindsets and wrong thinking and false doctrines and wrong directions that have been embraced by the church are exposed and torn down. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not fun to tear something down. It's not fun to get in and begin to tear apart something that's old. Just recently in our home, I made the mistake of deciding I need to change three or four walls in our bedroom because it was old. And I had to start tearing down, first of all, the ugly paneling that was there for 30 years. And behind that, I even found some more ugly drywall that had to be torn down. But before I could put the new drywall up and put the insulation in and reroute some electrical work and put a new phone line in and a cable in, I had to tear something old out. I had to tear the old out so we could bring the new in. Come on, somebody help me here tonight. And I want you to know that that's not an easy transition. It's a difficult time. This week alone, we've had people, ministers call me, and I know it just was planted in my heart and in my spirit Ministers that have accepted the message of the cross. And they've begun to preach it. They've begun to teach it in their churches. And several I had talked to before and I said, listen, brother, if you begin to teach this message and preach this message, get ready. Because basically when you begin to approach the false doctrine in the wrong direction and the wrong mindsets that the church has in fact embraced... Can you pardon my uh, verbs or for a moment? All hell is going to break loose. And I want you to know you're going to lose some people before you gain some people. And they said, oh, brother, they're being so blessed by this new knowledge of the cross. That won't happen. My people have embraced it. That was a year and a half ago. 
This week they called, they said, you know what? What you told me a year ago is starting to occur. What you told me a year ago would happen. I've lost five families in the last two weeks. All hell is breaking loose. They're attacking me. They're attacking your, uh, my ministry. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why all the disruption. I thought that if you preach the word of God straight and you preach the word of God true, all you could get was prosperity, peace, and joy, and the whole church would rejoice over it. And I'm here to tell you tonight as an encouragement to those of you that sit in the pews as well as stand behind the pulpit that God has a great plan for the church and he's got a great new direction for the church. But I'm going to try to, the best that I can tonight, encourage you both as lay people and as ministers of the gospel to help you understand what happens when we deal with a church in transition what we should expect, what we as ministers need, how we need to approach it, and what God has promised will be the end result in the end. And I want to preach to you tonight a message simply entitled, The Ministry of the Cross. The Ministry of the Cross. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, I'd ask that your anointing, your presence would come, the preacher would come, the teacher would come. And Lord, you would open up to us tonight the knowledge and understanding of what it is that occurs when your word is embraced and your word is preached. And Lord, we can look forward to that which you are doing and that which you have done. But help us not to stumble in the transition period. Help us not to grow weary in well-doing. Help us not to release the truth that what we sow we shall reap. And Father, I'd ask that you would help those that are discouraged tonight or those that have been cast down, both as ministers and lay people alike, it will, by the power of your Spirit. And we'd ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. And Amen. I chose this passage in Jeremiah, rather felt directed by it in regard to this message, because in it we see the call of God really in an overview in just a few verses, and I'll go to that in a minute. But in this time of transition, in this time of reformation, the first thing that the minister is going to have to do the first thing that if you're going to be a man of God, a woman of God, or you're going to be the people of God, the first thing that's necessary, point number one, is that you're going to have to embrace, apply, and thirdly preach the message of the cross. You're going to have to embrace, then apply, then proclaim the message of the cross. You're going to have to embrace, you're going to have to apply, and you're going to have to preach the message of the cross. You can't just sit in the pew and be stagnant, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to have to make a decision. We're going to keep preaching this message until you make that decision for or against the message of the cross. Then we'll work with those that, in fact, have embraced it, and those of you that reject it will remove yourselves. We won't have to ask you to leave. You'll leave yourself. Minister, when you in fact embrace and then personally apply the understanding of the message of the cross of Christ, you'll have to preach it. You'll have to proclaim it because it becomes your life. It'll be in your message. It'll be in your life. It'll be in your mind. It'll be in your heart. It'll be in your spirit. You'll never grow weary of it. As one Bible college student said in a, in a devotion several years ago, uh, she got up and she said, if you ever tire of the message of the cross, it's because you don't have it. If you ever tire of the message of the cross, it's because you don't understand it. Because you haven't actually seen it. It hasn't opened up to you yet. And there's, that's why I say we're in transition. Do you realize that the majority of the church world exists tonight under law and not under grace? 
We are into the dispensation of grace, but the majority of the church lives under the rules and regimens and conduct procedures of religion and not in true relationship with Christ. And when we come along and proclaim the message of the cross, it forces the transition. It it causes the church to either accept or reject what God is offering. Very simply, and I'm not going into the full meaning of it, that take too much time and pull me away from what I'm trying to give to you today. But I, I say that, preach the message of the cross. It means, number one, that we must understand man's inability and moral bankruptcy. Not just before we get saved, but even after we get saved. And I want to say it again. It, we must understand man's inability, as Brother Swigert preached so well this morning, and moral bankruptcy. We are in a state that we cannot change ourselves. No amount of rules or regulation or personal conduct or disciplines will change the wicked, sinful heart that you and I have. Good time to say amen. Uh, that your neighbor has. Maybe that would go over better. But we don't, we have to come to understand that. That when I'm saved, I'm not perfect. I've just begun the process. And the process has to continue by keeping and maintaining, secondly, the proper object of faith. And the proper object of faith is not what, is not in what I do. It's in what he did. The proper object of faith then for the believer who understands that he is, yes, a new creation, that he is in fact in relationship with God, that he is in fact declared the righteousness of God, we evaluate ourselves and like Paul say, oh wretched man that I am, I have no ability to live for God in my own strength, I must in fact continually look to the source of my salvation, which is what Jesus did at Calvary 2,000 years ago, and every day I place my faith in that, and as I'm a as I mature in Christ, I become more dependent upon what he did, not less dependent. I maintain the object of my faith. And when I do, thirdly, the continual flow and river of the Holy Ghost is available to me to change me. Philippians 1 and 6 says, He that hath begun a good work in you will continue to perform. Not you perform, his performance. Not you working, his working. And that's what God wants. How does God then accomplish that? By you understanding that without Him moving in your life and moving by the power of the Spirit in your life and the Holy Spirit free to work, you are incapable of living for God. And the church doesn't want to hear that. We want to proclaim how good we are. I'm a new creation and so I can. Blah, 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 blah. Religious rhetoric. I'll make up my mind, I'll grit my teeth, and I can. No, you can't. You couldn't before it got started, and you can't accomplish it after it begins. It's Him working in you. It's God working in you, both to will and to do, of His good pleasure. That's Christianity, and in a nutshell, that's the message of the cross. And you must embrace it. You must apply it to your life. And then you must proclaim it. This message must be proclaimed not just by the ones behind the pulpit. We are to instruct and proclaim it, but you are to embrace it and apply it and preach it as well. And encourage others to embrace the power of the Spirit that's available when we place our faith properly in Christ and Him crucified. So when I say we're in a time of transition, that's what the transition is all about. Accepting embracing, applying the message of the cross. There is no choice. Anything less is not Christianity. There is no other way. I said there is no other way. There is no other way. We're not talking of one of 15 or 350 denominational choices here. We're talking of one way. We're talking of one way. We're talking of one way. This is a narrow way. Oh, well, Brother Larson, I don't have to embrace that. You have to embrace that or hell will be your home. And I can't say it stronger. 
I'm warning you. I'm telling you. You must understand what's being said and embrace it and apply it and proclaim it yourself. You've got to stand up for it. And in a time of transition, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be hard. How do you think they fell in the time, felt in the time frame of the Reformation? We look back at it and we say, oh, wasn't that wonderful? Whoop! Oh, hallelujah. You know, Martin Luther, he just nailed that thesis on the door in Wittenberg Castle. And oh, everything was just roses and glory. Most of them were killed for their stance. And if the church could kill us tonight and legally get away with it, they would do it, and I'll prove that to you from Scripture in a moment. I'm telling you that we are in a time frame of transition, and God is bringing about a reformation, but it's not going to be easy. I'm trying to tell you, I want you to know what to expect, because when the devil hits, and the hard times come, and the things hit you, I want you to be rock solid sure of the foundation upon which you stand. When the wind blows and the storms rage and the rains come and the waters rise and the fire burns, I want you to be equipped to walk through the water and I want you to be equipped to walk through the fire. Not in the strength of religion, but in the strength of Christ and Him crucified. Jeremiah, let's look at it. Jeremiah really uh, gives us the aspects of ministers and their calling, and I, I won't spend a lot of time in here, but in verse 5, it, uh, Jeremiah is reminded in his call to the Lord that, number one, a minister is created for that purpose, the purpose I've just spoken of. You're created for the purpose of equipping the people. You have no other purpose. Therefore, you must not have any other direction. You have no other purpose. You were called and formed to preach and proclaim this word before you were formed in your mother's belly. And that includes not just preachers, but every one of you that sits in this pew. You're a witness of the power of the cross to all. Secondly, a minister must be dedicated by God and for God. Jeremiah was sanctified. He was ordained in verse 5, it says it. Sanctified means we're set apart for God. Ordained means that we're appointed by God. I can't tell you enough, and I can't get over saying it as a pastor, how many times you need to realize that you as a child of God are specifically sanctified and set apart for the work of God, and he has a specific appointment for each one of you. And you must find it and attend to it. So get rid of all the other goals that you have. Get rid of all the dream and dreams of all that you can be. Throw them in the basket and say, God, what do you want with my life? God, what do you want? You are set apart not for your own purpose, but for God's. And ordained, each one of you, for a specific function, which you must find and encounter. Thirdly, in verse 6, the Bible says, don't say that you're a child, Jeremiah. We must not, as people of God, look at our abilities or our inadequacies. Because to look at them and to concentrate on them then tells us that we're truly not counting on Christ. If you say to God, I can't do that, you're counting Him as inadequate. And if you are saying, God, I can do that, then you're saying, I have the ability to perform that. Both is a wrong idea. God, I'm incapable of, in fact, performing what you want me to do, but my dependence and my sustenance is not from within myself and intrinsic ability, but it comes from heaven. Paul would say it this way, we are sufficient not of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. So we must not say, I'm a child. I can't speak the message of the cross. I can't proclaim it to the people. Because you're looking at what you think you can do in and of your own self. Don't focus on your abilities or your inadequacies. Fourthly, the minister in verse 7 is told that you're to go to all that I shall send thee. A minister must minister where God places him. You've been placed specifically in your job, in your function, in your place, wherever it is. God placed you there. Specifically. You say, well, I don't like that job. God placed you there. The minister says, I don't like that church. God placed you there. 
The people say, I don't like that pastor. You better get to like each other. God placed you there. Steel, sharpened steel. Come on, somebody, help me. In other words, we can't just lollygag around, decide where we want to land, anywhere that we decide to go to church. That's good. God places you in specific places, and you better minister and work where God places you. Come on, somebody, help me in here. We must also see that a minister must speak what God gives him. You don't have a choice in what you speak. I don't go to this word and say, Lord, let, let, me, let, me, let me preach this or that. I have no desire whatsoever to stand before you and give you anything but other than what God I feel is placed on my heart. I don't want anything else. I don't want a sermon that'll just make you shout. I don't want a sermon that'll just make you cry. I don't want a sermon that'll elevate you. I don't want a sermon that'll do this or do that or do this or do that to you. The truth is, I am most of the time don't have any idea what God is going to end up doing when I preach something. That's really not my business. It's my business to speak the word and let God do what he wants to do with the word as it comes forth. So I have to what? As a minister or as a person of God, understand I'm created for God's purpose. Be dedicated, sanctified, and ordained to God. Not count upon my abilities or inadequacies. Not look to where I can minister that pleases me, but look where God places me. Speak what God gives me. Look at verse 8. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. If you ever stand behind a pulpit, you'll understand that message. You see one face, I see 500. And some of them aren't sweet. Some of them aren't accepting. Some of them aren't, come on, Brother Larson, hallelujah, amen. Some of them are, I wish I had my 12 gauge. (laughs) Some of them are sitting there with our arms crossed saying, I know better than he does. But here's the point. I made it just a moment ago. The end result of ministry will not show on your face. And I can't judge the end result of my ministry by what I see on your face. Because the end result of the word of God is that it will get down in your heart. And your countenance can change far faster than your heart can change. I worry about somebody that's always smiling. I don't stop smiling because I said that. But notice what God says to Jeremiah. Look at this. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. When you really start giving out the word of the Lord, not everybody's going to be pleased. And there's going to be some people, if they could, if they had the possibility, they will destroy you. Because they don't like what you preach. They will gossip about you. They'll send out false pictures about you. It's an inside joke. (laughs) I came tonight on the platform and somebody had pulled off a picture of some Lauren Larson off the internet, but it sure wasn't me. I don't know who it was. They were all teasing me saying, that's what you look like in 1975. And that's not me. But that would be mild. I don't know who it is. It might be a Lauren Larson, but it's not this Lauren Larson. (laughs) Oh, boy. But folk will try to attack you. They'll try to tear you down. They'll find anything about you to try to disrupt you and, and point to you and say, see, you're not perfect. But the problem is the Word of God has been doing some cutting. And the word of God has been doing some penetrating of that wicked, stubborn, resisting heart. And so instead of just embracing that which God is saying, we try to find fault with the minister. And if we could gossip about them, if we could tear down their character to other people, perhaps the convicting power of the Holy Ghost would not seem so dire in our hearts. If we can belittle them, we can ignore the moving of the Holy Ghost. God says to Jeremiah, I will deliver you. I've got to tell you, ministry isn't just fun and games. Go to the call of Isaiah, chapter 6. Isaiah, chapter 6. I want to show you something. Well, I'm not supposed to be afraid of their faces, Lord. I'm not supposed to be concerned. And, And most preachers are just like Isaiah when he was cleansed and ready for his call. 
in Isaiah chapter 6, as he's cleansed by the power of God, God asked the question in Isaiah chapter 6, who shall we send? Isaiah, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. Oh, it's going to be great. I'll go, I'll go. God says, good. Verse 9 of Isaiah 6, are you there? He said to Isaiah, who would be sent as a prophet, a man of God to the people of God. A man of God preaching not to the world, but to the people of God. A man of God to the people of God. And he said this, verse 9, Go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. They were going to hear what Isaiah would proclaim, but they wouldn't embrace it or understand it. They were going to see with their own eyes the ministry of a man of God and a prophet in their midst, but they would not see what God was doing through that individual because they would reject the word of the Lord that came from that individual. Isn't ministry fun? Isaiah 6, who will go? I will go. What's my job? Verse 10, make the heart of the people fat. When you preach the truth, you're either going to break a heart or harden a heart. I said, when you preach the truth, you'll either break a heart or harden a heart. Why have we seen some in this congregation actually harden their heart and fall by the wayside? Because when the word of the Lord is preached, it will either break your heart or harden your heart. And ladies and gentlemen, you don't have a a sitting on the fence option. It is not one way or the other. Oh no, that's not very important. Oh yes, it is very important. I'm telling you right now, you're either accepting the message of the cross or you're rebelling against what God is being offering to you and you're hardening your heart to the things of God. There's no two ways. Isaiah, preach it. Preach it. Preach my plan of deliverance. Tell my people where they're supposed to go, what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to believe. Isaiah was excited. God says, make the heart of this people fat. Well, how long do I do that, Lord? Verse 11, how long, Lord? He said, until the cities be wasted without inhabited and the houses without a man and the land be utterly desolate and the Lord have removed men far away and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. We're going to preach this word until those that reject it are taken away. Said we're going to preach this word until those who harden their hearts are swept away in an apostasy. And I'm sad to say that will be the majority. I'm trying to help you here tonight. I want you to understand what you're in for. I want you to understand where we're going. I want you to understand when it happens, why some houses will collapse, why some ministries are going to collapse, why some things aren't going to exist the way they always did in the past, because God is going to take some things away because of the hardness of the heart of people who reject the message of the cross. I can't get hard. Is this hard? I'm telling you what's happening right now. I'm telling you, I'm proclaiming to you what God is doing in the spirit world and it's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. I'm telling you this, that he's going to make the heart of the people fat through the message of the cross and he says, you preach it, Lauren Larson, until there's nobody left to reject it. You preach it until there's nobody left to reject it. You preach it until there's nobody left to reject it. Until I've taken them all out of the way and everyone that's left has received it. Aren't you glad that he didn't stop there in Isaiah 6? He said, verse 13, but yet in it, the land that is, there shall be a tenth. Come on, somebody. God says, you know what? You're going to preach that message. You're going to proclaim my word. And most of the time, it will make the heart of the people fat. But be of good cheer, because there's going to be a remnant. 
I said there's going to be a remnant. There's going to be somebody whose heart won't be hardened by the message. There's going to be somebody who will embrace fully and purely what God has proclaimed to the, as the way of salvation. There's going to be a people in the midst of a people that will hear what God has to say in this hour. They're going to be anointed by the Holy Ghost. They're going to be set free by the Holy Ghost. They're going to be a power in God's hand, the power of the Holy Ghost, exhibiting the greatness and power and mercy of God in these last hours. But they're not going to be a majority. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 4. First, we need to embrace, apply, and preach the message of the cross. Secondly, as we just did, we need to review the aspects of what it means to be a minister. Know what to expect. Because a minister is going to have to tear down. And I, as you turn to Galatians 4, I'm going to say again what I said in my introduction, that when we are in fact preaching the word of God, we're going to root out something, verse 10. We're going to pull down something. We're going to destroy something. We're going to throw down something. But it's a church in transition. It's not easy. Are you getting it? I'm saying it. I hope you're getting it. Because when things don't go the way we think it should, we need to understand what is happening and why it's happening. To be encouraged in one sense and to repent if repentance is necessary in another sense. So we can get right with God and get ready for what's going on. In chapter 4 of the book of Galatians, Paul uses an allegory of what's going on in the church in his day. And what's happening is this church, which he began in the spirit and taught Christ and him crucified, study Galatians 3, 1 through 5, you'll see it clearly. He birthed the church in the Galatian region under the message of Christ and him crucified, but they've started to go away from it. Because the majority of the church and the majority of the preachers aren't preaching what Paul is preaching. They're preaching a message of law, a mixture of grace and faith in what Jesus did and who he is, plus your activity and how well you perform. Which means when you mix the gospel, you don't have the gospel anymore. I said, when you mix the gospel, it's no longer the gospel. When you add something to it, it's no longer the gospel. It's not the word of the Lord, it's the word of man. When you add thus and thus to the simple faith in Christ and Him crucified, you have changed the nature of the gospel. Do you understand what we're saying? When you add something to accepting Christ, as the church was doing and as the church in this hour does. You have changed the nature of the gospel. You have another gospel, you have another Jesus, and you have the power of another spirit. And it is not a weak, emaciated, downcast spirit, this another spirit, this other of a different kind spirit. It is a very powerful spirit that can sweep through congregations and cause men and women that have embraced error to jump up and down, speak in tongues, run and throw money on an altar. Fall down under the power of another spirit. I believe that God knocks people down. But he's more interested in picking us up. Another spirit. And in Paul's day, then the issue is the same as it was today. What is the pure gospel? And the majority of the church was not preaching the pure gospel. And the majority of the church was coming from Jerusalem. God had to shut down Jerusalem 40 years after the message of the cross began to, began to be announced because it would not accept it completely. And in a time of transition, which was difficult, 
We have to understand it would be difficult. Please hear me. It would be difficult if you were raised up a Jew following the tenets of the law as the, as the word of God described for you to then accept and embrace and apply the idea that I'm right with God not because of what I do but because of what I believe. It was rough. It was hard. It was difficult. And when preachers began to preach the un the, the, the gospel that was another gospel, it was easily accepted because the flesh moved toward it. So in this particular passage, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 27, Paul is encouraging the church of Galatia with a truth that I'll bring out as I close tonight. We have to understand that we have a church in transition. We've got to keep the big picture in view. We're moving, as the early church did, from law to grace, and not half law and half grace, complete grace. We're making the same move right now in this hour that the early church had to make in the first century because we've become so inundated with a gospel that's another gospel, we don't understand what the gospel is, so when the real gospel comes out, it doesn't sound like what we're used to, and it's hard to understand, and that's exactly what was happening in Paul's day. Do you see what I'm saying? So Paul says this to the churches in Galatia in verse 27. He says, it is written, rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate, watch, for the desolate, watch, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. What is he saying? You're a minority, church. You're a minority. At the moment, you look like the forsaken one. At this hour, you look like the one that's not producing anything. Come on, somebody help me in here. At the moment, you look like the one that God hasn't blessed because your numbers aren't as great as the one that has religion as its mother and the devil as its father. You don't, you don't have as many people in your pews, so you must not be successful. You don't seem to be birthing anything. I'm telling you, before we can birth something, we've got to tear something down. We've got to root something out. We've got to throw something down. Where am I? I'm in the tear down process. I'm in the throw down routes. I'm ready to rock religion to the very roots in the name of Jesus through the message of Christ and Him crucified. And right now, it may, Pastor, look desolate. Oh, you were shouting a minute ago. It may look rough. I've lost a few families. I've had portions of my family accept the cross and portions of my family reject the cross. Sounds a whole lot like mother and father and husband and wife will be divided over the true gospel and the gospel comes to bring a sword. Listen to me. Listen to me. The hour is here and the throwdown ministry of the prophets of God is here. It's time to separate yourself from religion and embrace the move of God through God's redemption plan and embrace the message of the cross. And for a time, for a time, for a time, in the tear down process and in the ripping away and the rooting out process, it's going to look, it's going to look like you're losing instead of winning. It's going to look like there's a subtraction instead of an addition, much less multiplication. But God said something I want you to understand. I said, God said something I want you to understand. You might look barren today. But God's promise is that the one who looked desolate is going to have more children. Is going to have more children. Is going to have more children than the children of religion. It may look bad today, but I remand you for 25 years. It looked a little lonely in Sarah's tent. I remind you that Hannah 
Before she birthed Samuel, the great judge, priest, and prophet of old had to go through a time of being barren. Before Isaac could come, there was a time frame of being barren. Come on, somebody help me. Before Rachel produced Joseph, there was a time... There was a time frame of being barren. It seemed desolate. Everybody else is blessed. Where am I? If I just say, money cometh. If I just confess my way out of my difficulties. And if I just rebuke the devil. I could be like everybody else, accepted and happy. You'd be miserable and living a spiritual lie and being destroyed by the enemy. That's not happy. Looks like we're desolate. We're a minority. But God's given us some instructions. Now I want you to turn one more passage. Galatians 4 and 27 is Paul quoting from Isaiah 54. I want you to know how to handle the desolation. I said, I want you to know how to handle the feeling of desolation. I said, I want you to know how to handle the feeling of desolation that comes in the transitory transition time. You've got instructions here. God tells us that we need to express our faith in his promises. He said in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 27 that many would be, that there would be more that were the children of the desolate than the one that was married. Say, well, I'm having a little trouble believe that. Well, God has some instructions for you. Look at uh, Isaiah 54. You there? Watch this. Here, here's your first instruction. Sing. Come on, somebody help me in here. Don't go quiet on me now. Three things. Sing. Number two, cry aloud. I'm sorry, break forth into singing. Number three, cry aloud. What does that mean? It means to rejoice. It means to stand up on your hind legs and give God praise for everything you've got and everything you think he's going to do. It means that you're going to stand up and you're going to cry out, shout for joy, and give a ringing cry. You're going to give vent to the joyful emotions that reside within your soul. You're going to be cheerful and you're going to be rejoicing in the time of desolation because while God is getting you ready to be productive, he doesn't leave you alone. He doesn't leave you in misery. He's doing a work in your heart. He's doing a work in your spirit. He's doing a work in your soul. And even though you may not see the children yet, there's something on the inside that says the children are going to come. There's something going on. Oh, I don't know what I got, but I got a hold of something I never had before. And so instead of worrying about desolation and what I can't see, I think I'll say glory. I think I'll just have to get up and work and shout glory to God. Hallelujah. What are you shouting for? I'm a desolate one. What? I'm desolate. What? I'm desolate. But I'm not going to be that way long. Hey, I want you to know that you can have the power of God today and the power of God tomorrow if you embrace the message of the cross. The power of the God will get you right and will prepare you to bring forth children that will be right when they're birthed into the kingdom. And if that's not reason enough to shout, you need a new Bible. You need to get saved. If getting people into the kingdom doesn't make you happy anymore, you've lost sight of the nature and direction of the gospel. We rejoice because our names are... That's enough. You ought to be crying. You ought to be breaking forth into joy. You ought to be singing. I'm expressing what I... In the time of desolation, in a time of transition, when it looks like all hell is break loose, start praising God. You know what's going on on the inside of you. You know what's going on on the inside of you that never went on on the inside of you before because of the message of the cross. You need to shout. You need to give God glory. You need to give God praise because you're a member of the desolate group that's going to bring forth more than that which is now married. I'm telling you, God's going to reverse the reverse and the last shall be first and the first shall be last. I hope somebody gets a hold of what I'm saying. Hey! It's not time to sit down. It's time to shout. 
It's not time to give up. It's time to sin. It's not time to get down. It's time to give God praise. It's not time to get down low. It's time to run. Hey! You ought to shout. You ought to shout. You ought to shout and give God praise. He's delivered you. He's saved you. He's placed his spirit within you. You're on the right road. You ought to give God a shout. You ought to give God a praise. That's not all you ought to do. Look at it. Sit down. God says, since you understand this, verse 2, you need to enlarge the place of your tent. You need to stretch forth the curtains of your habitations. I don't want you to spare anything. I don't want you to hold anything back. I want you to lengthen the cords and strengthen the stakes. What is he saying? If you understand what I've just told you tonight, I want you to get ready because you're about to give birth. And when you give birth, you're going to need a little more room. You're going to need another room in the house. You're going to need a place to build and a place to put the babies. The place that you're in now isn't a big enough spot. It's not a big enough place. Because when God takes the desolate and makes them into that which is fruitful and productive, this place won't hold them. I said this place is too small. It's too small. I said it's too small. They're going to come from the east and the west and the north and the south to hear the message of the cross. There's going to be many more that are the children of the desolate. So you better get ready. I said you better get ready. Come on. If somebody would have told Sarah and Abraham, we need to build another room. After 25 years of waiting, you'd say, you're absolutely nuts. Let's just call it a day. But God says, make another addition. Build an addition. Build an addition. Don't you spare nothing. Don't you spare nothing. I said, don't you spare nothing. What are you holding back for? Build you a tent. That's bigger than the one you got. What are you holding back for? I said, what are you holding back for? What are you hanging on to the money for? What are you going to use it for? I need you to build a bigger tent. I need you to buy another radio station. I need you to expand television. I need you to move in the power of the Holy Ghost. Because it may look rough now. But there's coming an hour when the gospel is going to be preached unto all the nations. And then, when they've all had the opportunity to reject, I'll come. God will tell the prophet Isaiah, fear not. He would tell us that the glory of the latter house would be greater than the former. Solomon's temple was built in the glory of the kingdom at the height of its power. But the latter house was built in a time of weakness. And it's a greater house because it was God who raised it up. And not man. He tells us tonight, fear not. You will not be ashamed. I will not put you to shame. The mistakes of the past shall be forgotten and the reproach of thy widowhood will be gone. Would you stand with me? Come on, let's worship. Just raise your hands and worship him right now. Father, let your glory right now fill this house. Let your glory as a witness to this word, O God, that we've heard tonight, let it fill this house. Let it fill this house as we worship you. Let it fill this house as we praise you. As we cry aloud and break out with praise. As an expression of our belief that the greater is yet to come. 
Hallelujah. I will pour water on your dry and thirsty soul. I will pour floods upon your barren ground. Thank you for listening to this podcast presentation from the Sun Life Radio Network. This podcast is made possible by the generous support of people like you. To contribute to this work, please visit www.jsm.org or call 1-800-288-8350.